let's move on to our next speaker, Randy Enkin. Uh, he is the president of the RASC Victoria Center. And uh, the subject of his presentation this evening is Selenophile or Lunatic, 30 Years of Observing and Loving the Moon. Over to you, Randy. Thank you very much. Just a sound check. Can you hear me? Very good. I want to say, first of all, that I am so impressed with the uh, the Sky This Month uh, segment. I, in preparation for this uh, presentation tonight, I watched a few of your uh, past uh, recreational astro astronomy nights, and I think they're unparalleled. I, I watched several of these things, and uh, the detail and the enthusiasm of the whole team of people that are doing these, it, I'm enjoying it a lot. I'm going to be following it in the future. Anyway, yes, I, uh, I'm i a Selenophile. I love the moon. I, I know that there are members of our community who think of it just as light pollution. Uh, I, I'm actually sad when it's new moon. I, I wonder what am I going to do tonight? It's, 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 my thing is the moon. So let's have the slides move. Very good. It started for me on uh, June, July 20th, 1969, I was uh, at summer camp up in Halliburton, sitting in this room. There was never any television except for this one night. They put two fuzzy black and white uh, televisions and everybody was in there cross-legged. And it was to watch the uh, first landing on the moon. And, you know, all the other kids wanted to be astronauts. I, I thought it was the astro astronomers that were the really cool people. And so that kind of set me on my way. And uh, here's a picture of me in 1970, a year later, with an eclipse of the moon. Uh, public address, uh, public announcement, uh, never view the sun directly through binoculars or a telescope. It will wreck your eyes. But uh, you can look at it with projection, as I did when I was uh, 10 years old. And uh, I just kept at it. I, I was never a serious astronomer, but it was always something in my life. And um, so, you know, here we are 50 years later, and I'm still crazy about this moon. Here's my talk. I'm going to uh, spend most of the time talking about this 30-year uh, time series of observations and how it's uh, it's kind of been driving my my lunar observations, but uh, then I uh, joined the RASC a few years ago and I got caught into these wonderful observing programs, and I'm going to finish off with a great passion of mine, Enkin's Daily Moon. So let's start with the 30-year uh, time series, uh, which started in 1990. Uh, I'm not really sure why, but I, I just had this idea and I had no idea it was, I was going to keep doing it. But we got to start by uh, just getting a common idea of uh, how the phases of the moon work and what notation I'm going to use as I record it. So as I'm sure everybody in this community knows, the phase of the moon comes from the angle between the moon and the line between the earth and the sun. So as the moon goes around the sun, then you see different parts of the surface of the moon illuminated. And for the purpose of my measurements, I uh, use this uh, convention. So, you know, first quarter is 25%, last quarter is 75%. That's pretty obvious, but what that means is that the full moon is 50%. And that, that's kind of funny, but just go with it. So zero for new, and we go through the waxing to, uh, phase, the crescent, quarter, gibbous, come around to the full, and then we are in the waning gibbous, third quarter and crescent, and then we get it to a new moon again. And uh, it's a very simple game. I just, every uh, time I see the moon, just naked eye, I look and say, hmm, that's going to be a 87% uh, uh, moon. So let's let's see what that looks like. So uh, these are pictures, not great pictures, but I took them with my Raspberry Pi and I kind of like them. Uh, so first of all, is this 
a uh, first quarter or last quarter, well, there's the Mari Procellarium, the Embryum C. This is the last quarter, and it's a bit past it. So why don't we call that something like 76%? Ah, 77 when I did it with uh, matching an ellipse to the terminator. Okay, now we're on the waxing side. And there you see that beautiful uh, rupus alti, the alti scarp around the Mari Nectaris. Anyway, so there would be a quarter moon, 25%. That would be 12, so 13, 14%. So yeah, there we are. Okay, it's hard when you're around the full moon. Sometimes it's really, really tricky to see whether it's before or after you gotta look quite closely at where the terminator, but we can see here, the terminator is on the right near the uh, Mare Crisium, the, the, the Sea of Crisis. This is after 50, this is gonna be 51, 52%, yeah. And one more example, oh, tiny thumbnail of a uh, moon. So uh, this is gonna be a very old moon, just before new, it's gonna be somewhere around 97, 98, there you go. Okay, so I just do it by eye. I don't do this uh, imaging stuff. And in fact, it's really tricky doing it by imaging. It really depends on your exposure, but it doesn't matter. Part of the game, I'm a geophysicist. I love playing with noisy data. And so what I've been doing is I've just been taking these really very simple measurements, writing them in my book. So there we are this morning. That is the 2021. 08, 04, at 311. Yeah, I actually set my alarm clock. If I set the alarm clock so that I can get up when the moon is about 10 degrees above the horizon, then I can see it through the crack in the skylight in my washroom. And so there we go. And, and it was 89% this morning. So every month, every lunation, I add 100%. Okay, so I go 0 to 100, 100 to 200, now I'm up into the uh, many thousands, and uh, this is set right now at uh, zero was in the year uh, 2012 when I restarted these measurements. Um, there's been a lot of life during these 30 years. Uh, so, you know, I started when I was doing my doctorate in Paris, and then I did a postdoc in Edinburgh, then I went to Victoria, got my real job with the Geological Survey of Canada. Meantime, I had three children, Daniel in Paris, Simon in Edinburgh, Hannah in Victoria. Um, I kind of, life got a bit overwhelming after six years. Then I got missed it. And so I started again. Then I went a long time. Then I was an empty nester. And I started being able to actually do real astronomy by staying up late at night, much better. So uh, th this is uh, right up to today. And um, if we take the slope of this line, so the rise over the run, then it gets to be, you know, a bit over uh, between three and 4% per day. And if you divide 100 by this number, then that tells you how long it takes to get from new moon to new moon. What is the synodic lunation? And uh, when we compare this to what, what much cleverer people with telescopes and fancy equipment do, um, I'm now 180 seconds off what uh, is um, astronomically determined or 71 parts per million. Just to compare the last time I turned the crank, which was a couple of years ago, uh, it was about 76 parts per million. Um, fun fact, the uh, Babylonians had the value accurate to 0.4 seconds. Now, they did measurements over a couple hundred years to get that. And so I, you know, but also they did a lot better measurements than I do. So taking that slope of that line, getting that one number, that's great. I mean, I just love it that I'm able with just my eye and writing down numbers for 30 years, I'm getting such an accurate measurement. But where I'm really excited is when you subtract that straight line and you start looking at the deviations around it. And when I started doing this, I saw that there was this kind of getting faster and slower. And I thought at first it was every year. And then as I went through a few years into it, then I realized it's more like 14 months. And now 
as I get through to uh, 30 years, 32 years of this, um, it's 412 days. And this is actually a thing. This is not just bad measurements. It was recognized in the 14th century by Ibn al I uh, And it has to do with how fast the perigee is going around the earth. If the perigee were fixed to the stars, so if the, if the um, moon, if the moon's orbit, that the ellipse was always in the same ellipse as you went around the year, then it would be exactly 12 months that they, they um, because it would just be the motion of the earth around the, the sun that would, would affect things. But it's a three body problem. It's actually a many body problem. Jupiter has quite an influence on the moon also. Um, and so it ends up that it's about a 14 month uh, shift. And uh, the Babylonians actually did have this because it's important in the measurement of when the, um, the eclipses show up. And that was very important. So through the ages, this has been a known thing, but I just discovered it with this simple measurement. And I love that. There's also a variation that you see each lunation and that's fascinating too. So uh, it hasn't got boring yet. I'm going to keep doing this. Oh yeah, there's my picture. I wanted to uh, remind you that by Kepler's second law, you've got the moon going faster at perigee and slower at apogee. And, uh, you know, this gets into the press. You know, everybody talks about super moon and they, they, they're all excited about it. And of course, it bugs me. It bugs me that they say, did you see the super moon? And of course, you can't see it with the naked eye. It's not a big difference between the uh, super moon and the micro moon. It's only 7%. Okay. And, and, to, oh, no, no, 7% in brightness. It's, it's 10% uh, in size. So that's why uh, Randall Monroe gave this uh, little spoof of what Superman would be like if he only were the same difference as the uh, super moon was. Okay. The thing is, it is really important for understanding that variation, that 14-month that variation, it's really important to get the difference in size. And I tried with various techniques. And uh, finally, I uh, got my family to spring for this beautiful 1941 sextant. I love it. And so every time that I see the moon now, I also take a measure of its diameter with this sextant. And uh, so uh, this presentation. The first time I'm showing off this data, I just turned the crank this weekend, uh, pull it, pulling it together. And so um, what you do see is it gets bigger and smaller between about 32 and uh, high 20s. The, the, there's some calibration problems I was having and it shifted here because the mirrors moved or something. I, I'm still learning my sextant uh, work. It's a wonderful thing. People have been using it for centuries for navigation and you get better at it. It's one of those skills that, you know, it's just like using a telescope. You got to spend time with it to get better with it. Anyway, uh, let's take a look. The, um, the new moon is uh, where we have these uh, reds. That, that's the old moon, the, the blue. Oh, actually, let's, let's go for where it's a full moon because people always talk about super moons and, and micro moons when it's green when it's when it's a full moon so when i started a couple of years ago i it was a super moon when it was full and then follow these green points and we see here when the full moon it's a micro moon and then lately it's been a super moon again and now the green points are going past it's going to go through every every um month the shifts when when you get the super moon and the micro moon Super cool. Where is it going to take me? I don't know. Give me, let me give you another talk in 30 years. Oh, these red lines and blue lines, those are what uh, the astronomers tell us when we are at perigee in red and when we are at apogee in blue. And it looks like my measurements lead what the astronomers are telling us. I'm interested in that. Let's see what happens. Okay, that was chapter one. Now let's go to chapter two. The uh, Lunar observing programs. So for most of those years, I didn't have a telescope. 
and I wasn't that interested in the surface of the moon. But then, um, you know, things change. I got myself a telescope, uh, and I met people in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. It was only about four years ago. And one of the wonderful things is the observing programs. There's the Explore the Moon program, the introductory program, which took me three lunations to accomplish. And then I, I am the most recent recipient of the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program. Can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that went in to the organization of this. It's a wonderful tour of the surface of the moon, and I can't recommend it enough. You really get to know our nearest neighbor, and even people who don't like the moon, who say it's just light pollution, once they get doing the Explorer of the Moon and the Isabel Williamson, it, it, they, they love it. And I want to say, if you are doing, if you're working towards your Isabel Williamson certificate, I'd love to get in touch. I think that the, we're, we're all doing this separately, and uh, it's it's something we should do together. Anyway, I'm not going to go through my whole Isabel Williamson talk because I spent the time on that other stuff. So uh, let me just show you three of my sketches. I, I, I became a sketcher because of this. And uh, so this was a sketch I did on July 7th in 2019. Important because it was the best view of Tranquility Base where Apollo 11 landed on the moon. I so on the 20th, so a week and a half later, I, this wasn't so visible, it wasn't near the Terminator. But here we see the Sea of uh, Tranquility and that's where it landed and it was very fun. And I got to give a talk at the center of the universe, the museum here uh, in uh, Victoria, the Astronomy Museum here um, that next week. And so I could show off this picture of what it looked like through my eyepiece. Here's my favorite crater, Clavius. Clavius. Uh, it's remarkable because it has this series of this arc of craterlets that makes this beautiful uh, crescent, uh, each one getting smaller. So these guys are about 12 kilometers apart. You have to go here to see a eight kilometer diameter crater. These guys are four kilometer. I couldn't pick them up that day. So that tells you what your resolution is. And this was a particularly good day. I often can't see this one. I've sketched this particular uh, crater probably a dozen times by now. Here's a wonderful view of the Imbrium Sea. Uh, another one of those craters with craterlets that I love is Cassini. Hard to see at first, but then you can find it. Uh, the Apennine Mountains, uh, Apollo 15 is, is at uh, the Hadley Rill over here. Uh, it's a great view. Anyway, so I did all of the 300 uh, features with these sorts of sketches and uh, submitted it. And then I got this very nice pin and certificate and I get bragging rights and I'm very, very pleased. And I'm still doing it. I'm still sketching. I'm still having fun with it. Okay, chapter three is a completely side project of mine, Enkin's Daily Moon, which you can sign up for on Facebook. I've also started putting it on Instagram. And every day I just post another picture of the moon. The moon represents the passage of time, illumination, the feminine and world unity. I've been posting a daily moon since August, 2014. So that's seven years I've been doing it now. So here are a few examples I started off with uh, some iconic pictures of the moon and, and from the ISS. This one I'm very fond of. A friend of mine who knew how much I love the moon made me this windsock. This is in my backyard and uh, I just love this. Okay, so here we jump to moon 93. Uh, this is uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night. And what I really like is like moving in and then you actually get to see what was Van Gogh's hand doing when he was painting this. I, I, and, and then you also see the passage of time with the cracks and the dust. I, 
So, so this is still the moon. This is another aspect of the moon. Now, what I love is all over the world, every society has the moon as a symbol, symbol for all sorts of things. Outhouses, New Yorker. Oh my goodness, New Yorker covers are so good at, at showing pictures of the moon. I often uh, do those, but look at this guy. This is dated 1942, August 22nd, 1942. And what this artist is showing is he, here is this poor young man who is in this, this terribly violent situation on this bomber during the Second World War. But look at his optimism, his bright, his, his, his sense of unity with the world looking at the moon, even though he has this very destructive job to do right now. This is one of my favorite pictures of the moon. I went to Chicago and with a friend, wandered around the city with all the skyscrapers taking pictures of the uh, of the moon. That was a really fun day. Walked a lot that day. Then there's 2017 eclipse. This is remarkable. I mean, take a look. You've, you've got the amazing corona. You've got the uh, activity on the surface. But you actually see the Earth shine. The dynamic range that is represented in this picture is just fantastic. And look at that. Somebody was very lucky getting this uh, double eclipse. And you even get the, uh, the jet trails behind this, 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 um, this uh, airplane. And this was the picture from, uh, what's it called? Jacob's Tree in California. Anyway, lots of planning to get this picture right. Uh, sheet music. You know, before there were recordings, they, they, the way people got their music was by sheet music. And they had wonderful um, covers to these. So uh, lots of songs about the moon. Moon is a universal symbol. A couple of years ago in May, the uh, Museum of the Moon came to Toronto. Here it is in the Aga Khan uh, Museum. So you could get nice and close to it. And then they hung it in off the Gardiner. So the Gardiner Expressway is right above where, where the moon is. And they held concerts and things there. That was really good. And uh, I'm jumping forward. This is this week. I'm doing uh, railway bridges. So here's the furthest fourth. And uh, here is a painting of the bridge in Maastricht. Okay. So come and join Ankin's Daily Moon. Doesn't cost you anything. You get to see some delightful pictures of the moon every day. Not like you would see through your telescope usually. So I'm just going to close. When I did my first thousand, when I got to moon thousand, uh, I made a video at my son's request where the moon is always in the same position and it goes through from the waxing crescent through the full moon to the waning crescent. So pay attention around here. It's going to go fast. So here we are in our waxing crescent. Lots of people do pictures of the waxing crescent. It's very funny. Very few gibbous moons in the world of art. That's my trip to Chicago that I showed you. These are a few gib gibbous moons. Now we're into the full. Lots of full moons, of course. Waiting for Godot, Netsuke, Rhodes, Paul Clay, New Yorkers, songs. I've got several themes that I just love. Georgia O'Keeffe. Wonderful artists, critiques, etchings, birds. I just choose themes and I go with them. Coming to the waning crescent and we end with a new moon, actually a solar eclipse. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you so much, Randy, and a very interesting presentation. Uh, I am unfortunately one of those people who thinks of the moon as uh, light pollution and a nuisance, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, especially all the measurements you took over the past 30 years. Very well done. I appreciate you uh, offering your presentation to us. Uh, let's go to Ennio. Uh, do we have any questions for Randy? Yeah, we have a number of questions and a number of comments that came up. <clears throat> so one of the comments that came up was uh, from Louis Rifkin. In light of this, the moon landing, maybe watch today's episode on YouTube's 
of two funny astronauts. Eric Briggs asks, <clears throat> your diameter measurements are great. Isn't it easier to measure the supermoon effect by timing the moon crossing the meridian on successive days? No, no. I mean, what you get there would be the speed of the moon. And uh, so, yeah, by Kepler's second law, you can get that. But what I'm trying to get is the distance to the moon using the, uh, the, the direct measurements. Um, I have this hope. I've got uh, uh, lunar imagers that are friends in Florida and here. Uh, Gary Varney and Mike Nash, and I'm hoping that I can get them to take pictures at exactly the same time and use the parallax to get the distance to the moon. And then from the relative differences, I can uh, then work out what the ellipticity is. Uh, but your idea is good uh, that using the um, using Kepler's law is is the complementary way. And I guess one of the things that I'd like to do is can I reconfirm using these simple measurements can I reconfirm Kepler's laws? Part of my game is to work out how our predecessors in the astronomy world actually worked out what they, they got. And, and if I could, from simple observations, rederive Kepler's uh, second law, I'd be a happy camper. So we have a, a couple comments where Warren Galva says, is there a listing to tell when a feature on the moon is at zero degrees sun angle? And which Eric Briggs responds with, it's possible there isn't a listing of non-sun angles for lunar features. Measurements of the lunar terminator are much more common, so you can add in or subtract nine degrees from that. Okay, so let me just say that the tool is the Science Visualization Service, SVS, of NASA. They have dial -a moon which is the most useful thing every hour of the year, comes out in December of each year, and you, you can take a look at what is um, going to be visible, uh, again, every hour of the year. And I've now got a bit of a reputation among lunar observers, and so people actually write me and say, when will I be able to see such and such? And I, I do that with the SVS. I... Doing it mathematically is one of my, uh, on my list of things to do. I want to uh, get going on uh, doing some, some work with Python to put in, dial in a lunar latitude and longitude and figure out where the, the moon and the sun angle will be. And a particular project I'm keen on is to look at where the uh, umbra hits the moon during an eclipse. Fortunately, we were clouded out uh, in, was it May? But I have high hopes to uh, do timing of, of the umbra going across in November when the, we have the next uh, eclipse. And to compare that, I need to do some programming in Python to, um, to be able to figure out wh where the relative positions are of sun, moon, and earth. Yeah, I'm going to need to pester you about some of your Python code at some point very, very soon. One Gallagher asks, so if Piton is at a terminator, we could add 12.2 degrees per day. After that, to measure height? Whoa, I didn't get the question. I think he's asking whether you can add 12.2 degrees per day and use that calculation to determine Piton based on when it passes the terminator. Uh, it on terminator past day and time, and then use that to determine its height. Okay, that's assuming a circular orbit, I believe. Anyway, wait. that person should contact me, please. Randy.enken, oh no, president at rast, no, victoria.rast.ca, president at victoria.rast.ca. So whoever that was, I'd love to get to a talk about it because it sounds interesting. The one, please feel free to reach out with your question. Andy Beaton asks, have you seen Mare Orientale? Any hints on spotting it? Oh, Orientale is wonderful. First of all, it's cool. It's in the West and it's called the Eastern Sea because it was only the, um, the NASA uh, 
Apollo missions where they, it was too confusing having East and West like it is for astronomical versions instead of how we, we use it on Earth. So they switched. So the Mare Orientalis is in the West and depending on the libration, you see more or less of it. And it's one of the really fun things to, to check out is how much of it is visible. You never see more than, oh, I don't think you ever see half of it. You only see like between 10% and a quarter of it from, from what I remember, but you can see the these concentric rings, the, 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 the um, mountain ranges going around its center. It's, it's an excellent target. Awesome, I'm gonna have to look for that myself soon. Lewis R asks, do you hope to take a trip to the moon? Heavens no. <laughs> no, I'm actually very much against space travel with humans. It, it, it's dangerous, it's expensive. I'm all for sending robots. I, I think that uh, we, we, we learn so much more. I think that the putting people in space is really a propaganda exercise. Sorry for the people who really, really are keen about going to Mars or whatever, uh, but robots are the way to go. I'm staying on Earth. And I have a couple of questions, if I may. Sure. So for the Luna pick that you shot with a Raspberry Pi, yeah. Which camera and lens did you use? Okay, that was an a focal uh, measurement. So I uh, I made this gizmo that swung the Raspberry Pi camera into the eyepiece, so I could accurately put it back in the same position. So I would line up where the moon was and then put it in the eyepiece. I use a Celestron Ultima Duo. I uh, I think I only had the 10 millimeter at the time. I've also used a five millimeter. And uh, at the time, I think that was a five inch Newtonian. My main instrument now is a uh, Canadian built and um, what's it called? Omicom six inch. Interesting. So you didn't use the official Raspberry Pi camera then? Oh yeah, the Raspberry Pi, Pi camera afocally over the, the eyepiece. And one last question that I have. So you mentioned the ring of craters impacting in Clavius. Yes, Does yes. the shape of that ring tell you anything about the impacting body? Uh, well, first of all, it tells you that Clavius is an old crater because it had so many impacts. And second, I, they're not in a line. So I don't think it's a uh, Levy Shoemaker sort of scenario where that was one event. I think it's just a wonderful cosmic coincidence that it produced that beautiful pattern. And you know, you, you get enough monkeys typing, they'll type up Shakespeare. You'll you'll get asterisms, but I don't know what the word is for 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 craterisms. Craterletisms. I have to make up a good word for that one. Sounds but good to me. And that's all questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Randy, thank you so much once again uh, for uh, volunteering to present to our center. Really appreciate your time. Mm -hmm.